Hey Katie. Hey Sarah. It's great to meet up with you here on Mozart Snapshots. Thanks, it's great to see you too, as always. So what's the plan for today? Today we are going to visit the Mozart Wohnhaus, or Tanzmeisterhaus as it was known in his day. Why was it called Tanzmeisterhaus? Because it belonged to a man named Franz Gottlieb Spückner. And Mr. Spückner was a dancer who was the Hof Tanzmeister in the Salzburg court and gave dancing lessons in his house. So Leopold knew Mr. Spückner? Yes, they were friends because both were employed by the Archbishop. And Mr. Spückner was also the best man at Leopold and Anna Maria's wedding in the Salzburger Dome. And who were his dancing pupils? Mostly children of the nobility, but Nanel also took dancing lessons from him. Because in those days, learning how to dance was part of a proper education. And of course, Leopold was very insistent that both of his children received a proper education. So what about Wolfgang? Well, little Wolfgang also got involved because Mr. Spruckner saw at once what a fantastic sense of rhythm uh, Wolfgang had. And apart from that, he was also the person who organized Wolfgang's debut on stage. On keyboard or violin? Neither, actually, as a dancer. And that took place on September 1st, 1761, in the school drama, which was called Sigmundus Hungaria Rex. How funny, I would have never guessed that. Yeah, me either. Anyway, when did the Mozarts move to the Tanzmeister house? In 1773, because earlier that year, Leopold and Wolfgang had been on concert tour in Italy, and Leopold wrote a letter home to his wife saying that they needed to start looking for a larger house because Wolfgang was no longer a seven-year-old, and so consequently, they couldn't all continue to sleep together like soldiers in one little room like they had to do in the Getreidegasse. Well, it was good that Leopold knew Mr. Speckner then. It was, but unfortunately by that time Mr. Spruckner had died, but the house had passed on to his relative, Anna Maria Robb, lovingly known by Wolfgang as Hansmeister Mitzel. And so he liked her? Oh, he definitely liked her, because she was actually the butt of one of his jokes. And right here we are in Mozart's phone house, so I think we should go in now. So what was the joke? Well, uh, Wolfgang wrote a letter to his sister from Munich in 1774 in which he tells Nanel that she must make sure to give his very best regards to Mitzel and to tell her that she must not doubt his love for her because although there are so many beautiful women in Munich, none can compare to her great beauty, especially in that lovely negligee that she always wears. Sounds like a message for his love. It was, except that at the time Wolfgang was 18 and the beautiful uh, Mitzel in her negligee was 64. <laughs> Poor Mitzel. Yeah. But so how long did the Mozarts live in the Tanzmaster house? Well, Wolfgang lived here until he moved to Vienna in 1781. His sister lived here until she got married in 1784. And Papa Mozart lived here until his death. And this must be the room where Mr. Speckner taught dancing. That's right, this is the Tanzmeister Saal. And not only did he teach dancing in here, but he often threw mask balls, which coincidentally, Leopold often performed for. And this is a great portrait of family. Yeah, this is considered to be perhaps the only authentic portrait of the Mozart family. And according to Nanel, it is an unusually good likeness of her brother. And who painted it? The artist is actually unknown, but the painting was undoubtedly commissioned by Leopold. So why is Mama Anna Maria Mozart depicted in a picture on the wall? This painting dates from 1780, and she died in Paris in 1778. Oh, okay, but to get back to the room, I gather when the Mozarts moved in, they did not use it for dancing. What did they use it for? That's correct. In their time, this room was actually filled with musical instruments, specifically a keyboard instruments, because Leopold would display the instruments that he wanted to offer for sale in here. And then otherwise, they gave concerts, they entertained guests, and they played a lot of games. And what kind of games did they play? Well, they played board games and card games, and then, specifically on Sundays, they had their little Bolzelschießen and get-togethers. And what is Bolzelschießen? Bolzelschießen is actually one of the most popular folk pastimes in the Alps. It's a game in which you shoot darts at special discs with an air rifle. They had air rifles in here around the exclusive instruments that Leopold was selling? They did indeed, and you gotta remember these kind of air rifles were not what was used for hunting or something. They actually shot small darts and had quite a small range, therefore it was possible to use them in a room like this. And this, for instance, right here is an example of a Bolzelschießen air rifle. 
Oh, I see. And was Mozart good at it? Mozart was very good at it because already at the age of 10, he was a member of the Salzburger Bolzelschießen Company. And I think he and his father just loved this together because they had kind of an ongoing competition between the two of them to see who could create the funniest um, scenes for the Bolzelschießen discs. And what did the scenes describe? Anything funny, often they made fun of friends in a good-natured way. And these up here are three examples of Bolzelscheibe. And um, as you can see, this one on the bottom, we know came from Wolfgang because in a letter to his father from Mannheim, he describes exactly what should be painted on this disc. And he said, you know, there should be a little guy with a bare butt who's bending over and saying, enjoy your meal. And behind him is a guy fully dressed with powdered wig and everything, bending over with his tongue out, apparently ready to enjoy the meal by licking the guy's ass. It sounds like a typical Mozart. It does. They must have had wonderful times here with their friends and these get-togethers. Oh, definitely. And, you know, one particular friend who was very often here was Emanuel Schikaneder. The librettist of Alfred Zauberflöte? Yes, and remember, not only was he the librettist, but he also commissioned the work and he was the original Papageno. And he had made an extended tour with his troupe here in Salzburg in 1780, and because they presented a lot of Singspiele, they got to know the Mozarts quite well, became friends, and therefore was a regular invitee here for their Bozelschies and get togethers. And so what's the story behind this piano over there? Well, this piano actually did belong to Mozart. Who built it? It is unsigned, but it is believed to be from the Viennese piano manufacturer, Anton Walter, who was one of the most famous piano builders of his day. And when did Mozart purchase it? He purchased it around 1782, which is also when the instrument was made, and he used it until his death. Did he perform on it? Yes, so this was not only his house instrument, but it was also his concert instrument. So not only did he compose on it, but he performed on it extensively. He was living in Vienna at the time, wasn't he? That's right, and at this time he was really giving a massive number of concerts, and you know, mostly as a keyboardist. And so consequently, this was the instrument that he was using when he composed and premiered more or less all of his great piano concertos. And what did he play usually? Oh, he played all over. You know, he would play in the salons of the nobility or in the salons of wealthy arts patrons. He would play in theaters. And then, of course, he had his own uh, subscription concerts. What are subscription concerts? Well, those are concerts that he set up himself because, remember, by this time he was no longer in the employee of the uh, archbishop and so consequently he had to find ways to earn a living. And so he would organize these concerts and advertise them in the Vienna newspapers and, um, you know, when people signed up for them, they would not only get to hear a private premiere of his latest piano concertos, but they would also receive engraved copies of these piano concertos so that they could then perform them at home. But how many people had orchestras at home to play the piano concertos? Well, probably not very many, and so Mozart, being the smart guy that he was, not only gave them the original versions with piano and orchestra, but the engraved copies also included versions for piano and chamber ensemble. Smart idea. Did he compose those concerti specifically for those subscription concerts? Yes. For instance, this is the case of the concertos K413 through 415. So we know that the very first concerto that he composed for these subscription concerts was number 11, K413. Incredible to think that he probably played those concerts on this very piano over there. It is indeed. Has the piano been changed at all since Mozart owned it? Yes, because remember, in those days, the piano was the newest, hottest instrument, and so consequently, it was evolving so incredibly quickly. So a piano from 1795 would have been quite different than one from, say, 1800. And so in the case of this piano, the hammer mechanism was altered, and then also probably the damper mechanism, because in Mozart's time, when he used it, it was probably a hand-operated one versus the knee-operated version, which came later. Well, Katie, this has been interesting as always. Thank you so much. And before we say this to next mall, I'd love to take a walk through the rest of the house. Okay, so let's go through.